and then I will very I will basically um, want to say thank you to all that joined on this uh, afternoon. It's very sunny here. I'm in a very um, appropriate location, I think. I'm in the headquarters of Slow Food in Bra in Northern Italy. Um, and I think it was a, a perfect place to, to do this webinar and to, to host this group of uh, supporters, patrons of the podcast. This is the second time we're doing this. It's exclusive to supporters to have the opportunity to do Q&A with a past interviewee. And I was sharing already in the, the pre-talk with, uh, with Brendan that we definitely do need to do a deep dive. I think on the transition finance piece, we're gonna definitely discuss a lot. But we had only a very short one uh, just before the summer of 15 minutes. And there's so much more to discuss around the perennial fund. So I'm very happy to have Brendan and Phil here with us. And uh, I would love to start with questions from the room. I have a number of questions, obviously. Um, you might want to introduce you very briefly, Phil, because we haven't seen you in the podcast, although you're very uh, present, obviously, in the Regen Egg movement, but maybe a short introduction for whoever is sure. thinking, who's Phil? And, and sure. then we'll take it from there. Yeah, so I uh, co-founded Mad Agriculture with my wife about two years ago, um, really born out of the frustration of the modern food system um, and really sensing the need for a, a gigantic overturn of how agriculture is created and works on the landscape, um, really shifting the way we think about our place on earth from a, um, a mode of working with nature um, against you know, sort of the working against nature and, and there's a lot of imagination and creativity needed for that. Um, I grew up in a farming community um, and spun through academia, got my PhD in soil ecology and biogeochemistry, worked at Duke and Stanford, kind of in the upper echelons of the academic scene and, and ultimately felt that was unfulfilling from what I wanted to bring in manifest to the world. And so I uh, started Mad Agriculture, which is um, inspired by Wendell Berry's Mad Farmer Poems. Wendell Berry is a great agrarian in the States here um, and one of the elders that I look to for inspiration and guidance as we move forward. So there's a short one. Thank you so much. I, I've listened to a few podcasts with you and I think there, there's a lot more there to, to uncover. But let's, let's get started. If anyone, and I'm looking around because you all are around me on the screen, has a question for um, Phil and Brandon on the perennial fund, or if you want to do it at a later stage, it's fine. I have a few questions as well, but I would give it to the, the, the room first as, uh, as that's the, the Q&A format. So you can unmute yourself if you want to and just share a question or type it if you want as well. I don't see any concrete on you yet. Everybody's a bit you know, might be an interesting idea. Uh, Maybe, yeah. We could go over the model of change and maybe we could spur, there'll probably be questions that'll inevitably come up. Absolutely. And I would love to know, so what has changed in, I mean, Gina has a question. Sorry, Gina. Well, no, I was just going to say, what would you like to tell us in the first instance to kind of provoke us, if you like, or wake us up or shake mm -hmm. us down? <laughs> yeah. what, would you, what would you want to say to I us? I mean, they, they, did, the they did clean the whiteboard behind them. So I'm I'd, I'd like yeah. to know how it's going, what you need what the challenges are, what yeah. has been a good surprises, bad surprises, but I, I don't know if that's yeah. a Q and A format, so. Yeah, I think maybe just running through kind of our model of change, model and theory of change um, really quickly would be good to give context to how we see finance fueling the creation of a new system. Um, finance is one piece of things, you know, we're, we work in a holistic change that's, that spans poetry to science, soil to shelf, finance to marketing, all of those things have to change simultaneously from the language to the dollar. And, um, and we work systematically and systemically across them, um, all moving together to offer an alternative route and an alternative paradigm for farmers to live and thrive in. Um, and so I think our model of change, it, um, it lays the groundwork for seeing how the perennial fund is gonna work because the perennial fund is not financing without technical assistance. It's not financing without market access. It's not financing without good virtue and value underneath it and good farm design. So let me, let me walk you very quickly through our model of change in the whiteboard. And then I think we should, you know, that'll take maybe five to seven minutes. And then I'll, um, we'll focus on the perennial fund and how we see that working and, and why. Does that sound good? 
Yeah, and then I can address some of your points about challenges, where it's going, you know, the status of the fund and such. Okay, I'm gonna pull that chair up on the table. Yeah, okay. Um, give us a sec. Um, so the way we work um, is we always start with the farmer. Um, the, the farmer is the, the, the steward of the land. They represent the nexus point between, you know, basically our most intimate relationship with nature, eating food. I mean, that's how we interact with nature in the most intimate way is through that stewardship and reciprocity. And so everything, you know, we want to support the farmer and co-create and give rise to their vision. We often find here in the States that farmers are wrapped up in systems that they're really frustrated by, have no idea how to break or exit. Um, especially with really tight margins, net income being below zero dollars this year. Um, farmers are utterly stuck and they've not even been given permission to dream about what their land could be or wants to be. And so our, our initial work with farmers is always based on um, the sort of core, which is um, how do we vision with them and plan a regenerative farm um, that creates both financial and ecological wealth. And so in our farm design process, um, we always think about how explicit um, the return on investment is for both the, the money and for the ecology in an attempt to design systems that build whole or true wealth. That's really the goal. Um, we, you know, I, I was sharing this with Gina the other day. Um, the real world runs on sunlight and the carbon cycle. We, you know, the modern money economy is an abstraction of, of value in some, in some ways. And so we're, we know that and things live and die by the paper dollar. And so we design farms that are always profitable knowing that that's the way they have to work, but they also have to create um, ecological wealth at the same time. And so our vision and planning process um, is sort of designed in a couple ways. Um, one way to view it is, is sort of concentric circles um, with the farmer being in the middle, the farmer in the family, in their, de their decision-making team. What is the, and this is kind of, it pulls a little bit on Simon Sinek's golden circle concept where it's like, what's the why? What are the values? Why, are, why is the family there? The family is usually not there because they wanna make dollars. They're, they're usually there because of heritage reasons, spiritual reasons, a sense of belonging, togetherness and community. And so Mad Ag does not shy away from going into that kind of heart and soul space. In fact, we're really good at going there. You know, we break bread, we, we sit around the kitchen table, we laugh, we cry, we get to know their kids. And because everything that we do on the land is founded um, with trust. And so we never show up to the farm trying to sell or peddle, you know, a, you know, a new input or, um, you know, a new program. It's really a deep interest in asking, okay, what's your vision for the land and how can we break you out of the industrial ag system and create that off-ramp into a regenerative um, mode of living? So we, we work really at like, what is, we ask the farmer, and often they don't have like the, the toolkits to fully go here, but it's, it's really fun and kind of adventurous to ask them, you know, what's their mission in life? What are their gifts? How do, the, how do, you, how do your gifts express through your interaction with the land? Um, and we let that kind of exercise give rise to what the farm ecosystem is going to start functioning as and being designed as. And so in this next layer, it's really the farm or the ranch. Um, and this is where we start bringing in um, the yeoman scale of permanence and some of the more permaculture agrarian stuff, understanding that we're applying all of those principles to farms that are 500 hectares or more. Our central goal are really big farms that dominate land. And so we, we shy away from the language that's scary. And we, we often talk about, you know, for Americans, we talk about freedom farming. You know, what does it mean to be independent from the companies? What does it mean to be a patriot and be in love with your place, in love with your soil, um, be a member of your community that isn't, you know, hooked up to welfare farming and government subsidies. So we, we invigorate the values of the farmer in the language that we use. And um, we're just very strategic about it. Um, you know, if we're working with someone in Boulder, we'll talk about carbon farming because that's what they like. That's their story. That's what they find resonance with. When we're in the middle of the plains, 
for someone that's voted for Trump, you know, we'll talk about, you know, patriotism, independence, and, you know, put American flags on our, um, you know, on our, our pro, you know, on our, our, on our paperwork. So it's, you know, being, using language to connect with the farmers to find shared value is a very important thing to do. Um, I'm, I'm getting a little long-winded, but um, so in this farm thing, what we do is we roll through the scale of permanence to really highlight where there are strengths or weaknesses within the farm system. So we work from the things that you cannot change in your farm system, like climate, to the things that you can change, you know, climate, water, geography, your tools, your infrastructure, your land, your plants, your soil. And we work down through those things. We basically do a SWOT analysis with the farmer because you know, you can't be prescriptive with a farmer when you're gonna be regenerative. Regenerative is a complex system that you have to understand um, the dynamism of because you know, if you were to say, hey, farmer, you, know, you should plant cover crops, like that might be number 10 on the things that are the best step forward for the farmer. And so we have to use a discovery process with the farmer to identify you know, what's the best way to step forward in a regenerative farm plan. So the, um, the, the next three things, this is really how the farm ecosystem interacts with society. Um, so you have the farmer tending the land, and then it becomes, what is the way that the farmer interacts with society? And so this is really where our three levers of, of change exist. And we know with a farmer that it's, it's easy to dream big on paper about what the farm can be, um, but it's really hard to activate. And so in our early work, you know, when we were developing our farm design process, pulling from holistic management, pulling from savory, pulling from agrarians, pulling from these really awesome farm design methods, we were noticing that a lot of the designs were just stuck in the idea phase. So how do you actually like activate it or, you know, enable it? Um, so the three levers of change that we use, I'm just going to erase this little circle, um, are community of practice, um, there's a lot of ways to say it, but you know, who you surround yourself with is who you become. Um, and so a lot of farmers are isolated. Um, and, and so we think about, you know, who do they surround themselves with, what conferences, what workshops, what YouTube channels that give them a sense of um, being in a movement. The second one is access to money. How are you going to finance and capitalize the farm operation? And the third is access to markets. How do we start decommoditizing the production so that there's a farmer's face and value behind every bushel of corn and soy sold? That's our vision. It's going to take a while. Um, the, uh, on the market side, in an effort to create financial and ecological wealth back on the farm, we look for opportunities to get paid for both crops and ecosystem, I'm going to say it, services. I don't like that word. Um, it's but, funny. A, a lot of people in the space don't like the word, but somehow we, we keep using it. Yeah. Well, yeah, I, I like to think about like, how do we create public good? You know, how do we pay a farmer for creating public good? You know, if they're cleaning water or creating drawdown, they're creating a public good that they should get rewarded for. And so I, I let, let's collectively think about renaming that because it's awfully utilitarian. Right now. Um, I had, had a long discussion with Tony Lovo of SLM Partners who hates that word and, and somehow, somehow it's stuck until now, but yeah, we, we, should, we should think about it. Yeah, good, good podcast discussion. Um, and so I would say we're, I'm going to just simplify all this in saying that, you know, on the crop side, we're working with brands and have strategies from like Patagonia up to General Mills. Um, and then on this side, our main uh, point of contact that we're working with is um, Nori. Um, we are currently their, their largest data manager um, and bringing the largest number of acres and numbers of farmers into their pilot launch of their market. And then we're also working with regenerative future capital here. Um, on a couple of projects as well. So, um, you know, we're cognizant of Indigo, cognizant of ecosystem service marketplace and all the others, but we really like Nori um, as the kind of front runner. So this is our model of change. Um, I'm gonna jump back over to the finance just to link back to the perennial fund, which is we, we came to the perennial fund in a recognition that um, there isn't regenerative capital out there that can actually catalyze these farm visions that we 
we started by looking, we split this bucket into two things. One was public funds. So how do we use farm bill? We have a very big farm bill here in the States. Most of it's like misallocated, misused, and poorly designed. It's not very different in Europe, I can yeah. safely say. I see that's yeah. laughing, yeah. Yeah, and so we, we thought that there would be some money here to really mobilize these things. It's not enough. It's some, and we do tap this bucket. But we, we got this glaring hole, which is what the perennial fund hopes to fill, which is basically, you know, we need an alternative bank for farmers that they can go to to finance this vision. Um, perennial bank, that's funny I wrote that. I meant to say perennial fund. Yeah, that's the first time. Yeah, <laughs> we, we like it. Yeah, we like it. Um, Are you applying for your license or let's just yeah. <laughs> um, So, but farmers need an alternative bank because, you know, they go back to the bank every year. Um, you know, getting their operating loan. And that operating loan comes with all of these stipulations, like what seed are you using? What fertilizer are you using? What elevator are you, I mean, they, it, it locks them in to that system that's made robust by government subsidies, by debt obligations, by equipment loans, like all of that is a, is a tangled and tight situation for a farmer. And so the goal of the perennial fund is to replace their operating loan and give them permission to imagine and move you know, really to regenerative and organic agriculture. Um, and so I think now we can kind of go into the guts of the perennial fund if there are kind of overarching questions about the model. Yeah, that sounds like a good plan. Probably get some questions. <clears throat> Any questions from Kai, Stais, Gina, Fred, Augusto? Yeah, and I would say that we're, we're processing, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so we're, we're implementing various components of this model across about 40,000 acres right now. So, you know, like about 20,000 hectares, um, in, mainly in broad acre um, staple crop commodity production. Um, we we kind of test drove this on small diversified market farms um, two years ago. And then last year, we've really been shifting into basically Great Plains commodity staple crop agriculture. Um, how, how do you find your farmers? What's your... Well, they come to us. Um, we, we go to them. Um, it's, it's both. You know, as you know, the community around Regenerative Ag is relatively small. It's represented here by the faces on the podcast. And it doesn't take long for someone with a good solution that's authentic and has trust and um, delivers value to be to spread like wildfire, you know. So, yeah. You know, they, when you... Gina, go ahead. Oh no, Fred, go ahead. No, please, Gina. I couldn't. Fred, after you. <laughs> <laughs> Fred? I insist. Oh, they, okay. They can do this for a long all time. Right. Okay, um, all right, so ahead. I'll go, then Fred will go. <laughs> and then we'll all back up. <laughs> Great. Um, thank you, Frederick. Um, I just wondered, it's quite a big statement to say the fund is going to replace their operating loans so i'm curious to know understand more about what does that involve does that mean you can are, are, are contracts breakable how long does that take what kind of finance does that take how easily does the farmer trust you to do that and on board i'm just curious to uh, mm -hmm. understand more deeply but i i, I don't know whether uh, frederick you have a, a question that's related or is um perhaps more succinct than that no, it's it's le uh, less technical, but I'm really interested to hear the answer to that to your question, uh, <laughs> Gina. Uh, no, I, I wanted to ask you actually about when you're uh, just on on the whiteboard, just below the vision and mission. You talk you talk about when you go out to the community. Um, what would be uh, if there is like the most prevalent um, issue farmers have with um, working with you and adopting like, uh, like changing their practices. Mm. What's the largest barrier? Basically, yeah. Um, it's it's the ability for us to help them see that it's it it drives an economic return and actually works. So um, the best way farmers learn is by visiting other farmers, seeing is believing, and shared experience is kind of crucial. And so um, what we try to do is is glue farmers together into these, that's why community of practice is our like foundational lever of change, because um, 
we can go into a farm and spout all of these wonderful, great ideas, but um, no one will take them up unless they know it works. And so for instance, you know, we're, we're working on like 10,000 acres here in Boulder County to transition a lot of farmers off of GMO crops and neonic based pesticides into, you know, sort of like a regenerative conventional, not organic systems. And so we bring our farmers that are leaders in that from all over the high plains to come in and do workshops, you know, PowerPoint slides, and then make those farmers accessible by phone. So if the farmer is trying something, they can talk to them as well as talk to us. And so that's, that's, I think probably the biggest barrier is the cultural barrier. Um, but it very quickly gets into barrier two, which is like, well, how am I going to pay for this? Um, you know, and, and I think people can dabble, um, people can dabble a lot on small acreage, but when it comes to like purchasing the seed to do scale, it requires money. And most here, most operating loans won't cover that sort of thing. Um, in fact, most operating loans won't even go out if you use cover crops um, because it, it um, affects whether your ability to actually get insurance, you know, for the crop. So, you know, the operating loan is in fact operating in the reverse. It's not enabling at all. It's actually a deterrent from doing regenerative ag. So, um, yeah, so the money thing comes up quick. Mm -hmm. Thanks. And Gina, just to your point, I can just go over the general model of the fund and then we can talk about um, you know, if it'll replace their whole operating loan and such. Um, so, you know, the gist of the fund, I think you've all read the five pager before, uh, but it's a means of essentially helping them through the organic trough that many farmers see. So, yeah, you just wait. see this. Yeah. So let's say this is year 10 this is year zero and a farm wants to transition to organic, many growers experience a trough right here where they're losing 50 to $200 an acre because they've basically taken the chemical dependent, input dependent soil that used to rely on all these agro inputs and usually growers see a yield hit. That could be anywhere from 10 to 40 to 50% depending on where their soil health was before. So this piece, is a big deterrent because to get to USDA organic certified, you know, it takes 36 months from the last application of a prohibited substance, whether that be a GMO seed or nitrogen input, glyphosate, whatever that may be. So this, to cover this gap, it essentially means you can either go slowly and go one acre at a time. I'm oh, sorry. No, it's yeah. Okay. Okay. Sorry, I had an electrician. <laughs> <laughs> So they can either go slowly one acre at a time and be able to fund it and cash flow it from their other profitable acres. Um, you know, they can go in whole hog, but that means they're going to go deep into the red um, or they can find a lender that's going to work with them. But those lenders in the U.S. generally don't exist. They operate on, you know, they're on the annual mindset. They need to get their money back every fall after harvest and be able to pay back their institutional you know, sovereign wealth funds and pension funds and all the people that are providing capital for that bank itself. Um, so all we've really done is take that financing mechanism that's been around for decades, uh, an annual operating loan, and then just extend the time frame. So here, we're able to provide operating capital for three years to help the farmer through the trough, understanding that they're going to be losing money along the way. And then on the back end, once they hit certified organic, where generally they can be anywhere from three to five to six X as net profitable as conventional acres in the US at least, we're able to then share in that upside to pay back the loan. So farmer loses money during the transition, we provide capital to help them transition to organic as well as that full system of change. So every farm we work with, we help them you know, create a vision, create a farm plan, access new markets, monetize their carbon, and build a community with their neighbors. And once they hit certified organic, we participate in a net profit share on the back end until one and a half X, whatever was loaned out is paid back. So right here, that could be a, you know, 30 or 40% net profit share. We model it on a five year payback. So three years of distributing capital, five years of a net profit share to pay back one and a half X of what was loaned out. And then we build in two buffer years just to account for essentially weather that's going to be inevitable. 
potentially market risk too, if we can't find the right market for that given year. Um, so that's that's the general model. Um, I don't know if- Yeah, the other thing you is, have any is questions that, from that. in this trough, um, oftentimes the soil is, is pretty bottomed out. And so, you know, the most profitable way to get through transition might not be the best way to heal the land. And so this gives them the ability to, you know, perennialize during those three years and really focus. It might be like, you know, year one of transition might be a really interesting like nurse cover crop, you know, that's gonna like really turbo inject the soil with a lot of carbon and exudates. And we might perennialize to alfalfa and a brome grass for two years. And then you come in and you break that for your cash crop. Um, and so designing this transition that um, is not gonna make, is gonna do the best for the soil to ensure this outcome is our goal. Um, you know, some organic growers can, you know, eat buy through here using organic corn and soy and putting it in compost, but it's really not the best thing to do. It's a really pretty darn extractive. And so part of the way we work is designing um, rotations that are diverse and regenerative and finding market offtake for all of those things. So on our, what's cool about the perennial fund, Brandon alluded to it, is that, you know, most money doesn't come with wisdom doesn't come with market offtake. We, we um, provide all of that, you know, with the farmer. I mean, many farmers already have their markets dialed in, um, but some as they're transitioning, you know, don't. And so our partners on the back end, for some of them, it's gonna be, you know, very likely Patagonia provisions for like those special farmers that are going ROC, um, which a few of them will be in the fund. And then, but for most of them that are selling broad, you know, broad organic commodities, um, Pipeline Foods, which operates out of Minneapolis. Um, they work in the Driftless in Iowa. The core of where we're thinking about working is in the Driftless region in Iowa. Um, Iowa is really ground zero of the agricultural crisis here. And we feel like if we can tilt, tilt the system in Iowa, um, it's gonna create an inevitability um, in the revolution, so to speak. And so we also have really great on the ground partners there, including Practical Farmers of Iowa, and, um, and uh, Rodale Institute. And so, you know, the way we do good uh, farm design in the, in the middle of our, well, in the middle of what was up here, um, is that we believe in like first principles, ecological design that is place-based. And so, you know, we know that we're not Iowans and we don't have the best, you know, most effective farm design. And we have certainly enough tools to be dangerous, but we'd rather use on the ground partners there that are deeply, um, they, they exist within a, and, and operate within existing trust networks to do that work with us. And that's part of our theory of change, which is scale through replication. You know, Mad Ag doesn't wanna have field offices all over the world. We'd rather find the technical service providers, you know, in those locales and empower them um, through the economics of the fund. So that's part of the way that we see working um, at beyond perennial fund one. Yeah. and then. Uh, Brent, yeah, Brendan, can you explain point. what the, the, the three lines you draw, the family mortgage and, uh, and the other one that I cannot read? What, what yeah, are those? Yeah. And this was to Gina's point about, are we going to give out the whole operating loan or not? Um, we can actually function in two different ways. So we can either stack on top of their current operating lender as subordinated debt or uh, give the whole operating loan. Um, so, for example, let's say we were to work with a local community bank like comp here something who wants who understands that the organic transition many grow there this specific grower is going to lose a hundred dollars an acre we can essentially come in they can provide the main bulk of the operating capital which is probably going to be on the order of you know three to five hundred dollars an acre um, we know that they're going to that farmer is going to lose money during the transition and we can just fund that loss so they can meet their other debt ob obligations whether that be family expenses or their mortgage or, you know, their current operating lender. So in that way, we can help them transition. And that actually gives us a lot more efficiency because then we can impact many more acres by, you know, having the, we're, you know, the $5 million fund we're raising. If we give out $300 loans versus $3,000 loans, we're going to impact that many more farms. Um, well, that's a good, it's that's a good point, actually. So you're raising $5 million? So raising $5 million by what September 30th this year. September 30th, great. Yeah. Um, so that's one way to stack on top. The other way is by offering the entire operating loan and just understanding that 
during the transition, you know, it's going to come at a loss. And there's there's a couple options as well. Um, most likely, when we give out the whole operating loan, um, the farmer will pay what they can during the transition, um, which we understand is you know going to come at a similar loss. So we would still take that hundred dollar hit, but we would make up for it on the back end when we're hitting that one and a half x. Um, so two different options depends on you know if the if the farmer's lend, current lender is comfortable with it. If they are, I think we'd prefer to just take the dip so then we can work with that many more farmers and quickly mm -hmm. learn and you know be able to cycle capital a little more quickly. Um, but yeah, those are the two different ways we can work. You know, some of the uh, feedback we're getting on the ground and talking with farmers is that um, some of that operating loan costs them up to 18%. And in this, this is in, these are in like heartland situations where, you know, they, um, they don't have community banks that understand, first of all, the economics and the reason for this trough. Um, the other is, is that some farmers who want to transition to a regenerative organic system, they literally cannot get a loan. So it's sort of a context dependent solution that we're offering. You know, if we're working in Northern Wisconsin or Midwisconsin, mid Minnesota, where organic is more prevalent and abundant, then there's more of a stacking opportunity. So, you know, mm -hmm. part of the pilot fund is to test these concepts and we're trying to, you know, we're de-risking some things. For example, we're only working with farmers that are currently organic and want to expand their organic operation. So we're taking out the risk of like, oh, we need to find a certifier. They don't have the right tools. Like we're, we're, we're limiting the experiment in, in certain ways to test different kind of theories of change, so to say. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, yeah, that's a good point. So with the perennial fund, it will be focused only on organic farmers that want to go beyond. And the other work well, you're doing well, with Boulder, Boulder, et cetera, that's much more on the, the conventional chemical agriculture. Slight modification to that, which is that we're working with organic farmers that want to expand their operation, converting from chemical to organic. Ah, because they might operate both and they have a piece of land or yeah, so a piece for example, of operation. We work, we work with exactly. one farmer in Montana that has 9,800 acres. They sell to Patagonia. They sell to Timeless. They're, they're really fantastic farmers. They're um, and they want to expand another 2,500 acres. Um, they don't have the, the capital to rent that land and expand in that direction. So um, that's an opportunity where they embody everything that's good about organic and regenerative. And are in fact, well poised to get the ROC certification that Patagonia, Rodale, and Bronner's have been putting together. Um, but they don't have the capital to do any of that. So that we would come in and we would actually offer the whole operating loan for that transition. Yeah, and that hedges a lot of risk for us. Yeah, certification, finding markets, risk of reversion, all those other things that come up. Experience, <laughs> yeah. We're already up the learning curve and in it for the reasons that we'd like to see them in it for. Yeah. So hopefully, maybe in fund two, you know, we could fund beginning farmers transitioning to organic. But in this first one, I think we have to take kind of more strategic bets on where we take risk and where we aren't going to. Yeah, it's also... Um, you know, part of the way that farmer community changes, I mean, there's like on the social movement curve, the bell curve, on the far um, front moving side, the iconoclast, the first movers, like it takes a while for that first mover to turn into a community leader because they're often a bit rebellious. And so, um, you know, we are strategically working on the front bleeding edge of the iconoclast. That's like the Montana example. And then we also have the kind of first adopter, which are more communities of change. And the way that farmers often change is they look to what's happening across the fence line. They see the economic success. You know, they have a new Ford truck. And that, that's ultimately what starts getting them to question their own techniques and say, hmm, what are you doing, Bob? Um, and so we're cognizant of that. And so we'd rather in this first fund have those, create those beacons of change, those lighthouses on the hill, so to speak. So that in, in fund two, that gives us our nexus point for kind of radiating out from that community and inviting more people in. Um, we know that farmer field days all are the probably the most powerful moment. Um, well, I wouldn't know if they're the most powerful. They're probably the second most powerful way of creating a eureka moment for a farmer. Most farmers change after they have some eureka moment, like an aha. And um, that often will happen in a field day where they're astounded by, you know, just being able to put their hands in the soil when there's cover cropping being used and on their farm, it's hard as a rock. Um, that, that can, you know, inspire change, but the most profound is on their own operation, which, you know, that yeah. can be a little more challenging. 
achieve. And, and what Phil was alluding to is kind of the diffusion <clears throat> innovation and that curve in general. We're up here, we have those leaders and you know that are shooting for ROC that's like no-till organic. The organic folks, soil health, and we have you know the no-till conservation, like they're starting to catch up the curve, but they're probably still desiccating you know, glyphosate at the end of the year. And then this is old school, you know, heavy tillage, chemical, GMO, you know, use whatever you can, just the plug and play system. We're in the perennial fund really focusing on these folks, like that leading 13% so that we can pull everybody along and we show people that we can actually get, you know, out here one day. Wow, Th thank you so much. I'm gonna look at the group. Any follow-up questions, any other questions? From, from anyone uh, currently calling in. Otherwise, I have a few. I see Dice. Yeah, hey guys, uh, thanks a lot for, uh, for, this, uh, for making yourself available, first of all, for the explanation. Um, I was wondering, the, uh, the bell curve you, uh, you just drew there, that's, is that representative of the uh, total acreage at the moment? Where, because mm. in that case, uh, the, the no-till, uh, but still yeah. quite conventional uh, would seem quite quite large. Yeah. Well, is it, is it number of farmers or acres? acres? That's a good point. Yeah, yeah, third of all acres in the U.S. is no-till. One third. Uh, I don't know if this is necessarily re hmm. representative percentage-wise. We have a lot of no-tillers. It's it's just economically more feasible because they use glyphosate as their weed, you know, and then yeah. they have this, I would say this is no-till without cover crops. Without no cover crops. With cover crops. This is like the Gabe Brown on um, Ray Archuleta zone. Um, I would actually say that these these are probably tighter. Like ROC, I mean, in reality, ROC is here. Yeah. Organic is here. You know, we only have about 0.7% of U.S. acreage inorganic. And probably half of that is an industrial organic that is not in line with a R Rodale's original, you know, theories around organic. I mean, a lot of folks in the States, I'll just give you one little vignette. We have a conservation reserve program, which is basically when we have an oversupply of commodities, we pay farmers to take land out of production and restore it back to like native grasslands. Well, that's a 20 year term. They get paid a nominal piece per acreage. We have millions and millions of acres in that. Well, when those acres retire out of that program, uh, these chemical based farmers who have no consciousness around being organic are going, ooh, organic is paying two to 400% over my conventional. They get their old moldboard plows out of the weeds. They go out there, they break the ground for three or four years, and then they run it into the ground. And they use all of that soil wealth, and then they're done. And so we have, the, I would say a lot of organic um, is like that in the States, and I would say even globally. Um, and so we're very, we know how to suss those things out really easily. Just looking at your tool library, your mentality, all of that. Um, and so I would say that like most of the movement is here and, mm -hmm. and, and soil health is probably, you know, it's probably here. Yeah. But, but this was a general schematic, but I, yeah. I do think that it's, it's a, yeah. I had a question as well. This only came up since you drew the bell curve. So it sparked my interest. Uh, I had a question about the, how you're, uh, you're determining the uh, percentage of profit share or the one point times, uh, one point X times the, uh, so you basically, okay. you're not setting an, in, an interest margin up front. You're, you're setting uh, a sur sort of a, yeah, repayment obligation yeah. cover or something. Exactly, yeah, it's officially called the return cap as some, some people call it, but essentially what we're determining is well, I won't redraw it, but let's say we were to issue, you know, $300 uh, over the course of the transition, so $100 an acre um, for three years. The farmer would then owe $450, and we model that on a five-year payback. So take $450, you know, divided by five, we're shooting for a 90% uh, $90 return back to the fund. And depending on their rotation, you know, we want to optimize that so it's uh, the lowest it could be um, on for, on the individual farmer. So it's, it's not too much of a burden for them, uh, but it's probably going to fall within the range of 20 to 50 percent of their net, just based on some of the modeling that we've done with typical organic transitions in you know eastern Nebraska, Iowa, Minnesota, um, that type of region. And the reason that it's it's a wide range is really the difference in fixed cost between whether you own the land or you rent it. 
uh, when you own, most of the time you're paying about 2% of the land's value and just liability insurance and taxes. And if you're leasing, that can range anywhere from four to 6% of the land's value. That's typically what they would charge in cash rent if they're not doing a crop share or a cash crop share. Uh, but it's gonna be you know, very individualized because every farmer's situation is so different on whether they have a long-term lease, whether they own, whether you know, they're renting from family and they're just <laughs> doing a crop share. Um, so it's, it's very context-based, uh, but that's what we're thinking based on the numbers that we've seen historically from you know, 20 years of organic data. Um, on what the net profit share is going to fall within. We just really like that model because, you know, it caps the farmer's downside downside risk and enables them to transition to organic where we are only getting paid if they're doing well. And it ties ourselves to one another. And it incentivizes us to make sure that we're giving them all the tools that we possibly can and helping set them up with markets so that they have sustainable revenues and then also reducing their cost with you know, regenerative practices. Yeah, um, I would say two things too to add on to that would be, um, you know, one, the idea of the perennial fund was, you know, how do we structure our financial economics and our, and our models to be more like um, perennial old growth systems that we find most beautiful? You know, and you look at a sequoia forest or a grassland, their, their um, internal rate of return never exceeds 10%. Um, their closed systems, um, the balance between productivity and decomposition is is almost in balance and say so never they never exceed 10% and actually we're writing a kind of a concept paper you know like in all the ecosystem service language we've seen out there no one has ever written anything on like what is the IRR of a beautiful ecosystem and so we we need to we're starting to think about that and actually as a biogeochemist and, and an ecologist carbon cycle person I already actually know some data sets where I could start exploring that um, and we really want to build our financial tools to mimic what we find beautiful in nature. I mean, that's ultimately the harmonization that we need. And so I would say the 9% is IRR is built around that concept while also being tempered by the reality that current money will flow at a 9%, but maybe not at a 6%. You know what I mean? Like it, we, we're trying to sort of optimize what we see in nature with what we know the current system being willing to do. Um, we also like, you know, the, the effective interest rate for the farmer in the fund is about 5%. And so that actually undercuts the cost of capital from their community bank as well. So, it, you know, in addition to all the other incentives that we're providing, we're also providing a lower cost of capital um, as a lender. And so that's another, you know, added benefit. Yeah. And then another mechanism that we're thinking through is actually lower, lowering that one and a half X return cap and incentivizing the farmer to essentially pay off the loan early by giving them a lower return cap. So let's say instead of one and a half X, we shoot for 1.3 X, but to get there within a given amount of time for us to hit our target rate of return, they might have to do a higher net profit share, you know, over the course of two to three years versus five years, but that'll get the farmer to the 1.3 X. So in the short run, it might cost them a little more of their net profits, but in the long term, the total cost of capital for the life of the loan for the farmer is actually significantly less. Um, so it's, and that's good for us because that means that if we can get investors a return quicker, we can then cycle, you know, the fund and cycle capital quicker and raise further funds to then deliver more impact, which is great. I mean, maybe, you know, some investors might want to see that nine, 11% IRR over 10 years. So they don't have to, you know, investigate new investment opportunities, but I mean, we'd rather see that money be put to good use and help more acres. Yeah, part of the perennially, it's I mean, it's an evergreen fund. I mean, we're not. It's a it's a way that we can recycle capital back into it and grow it. Um, the other thing that I would say is that you know, in this initial phase, part of our approach is that you know, and it's been a really nice approach for Mad Ag is that we don't really we don't charge the farmer anything until they're making money, um, and we find win wins. So like when they make money, we make money. So in our like Nori work. You know, we take 10%, roughly 10% of the carbon value that's tokenized and sold, but that only um, that only happens when the farmer gets paid. And so we, we try to find the, and it's the same economics with the fund, the same model of the fund that, you know, in this first round, we're currently not thinking about taking the management fee. Um, that might change, but it would be really small. Um, but we're, 
we were essentially funded by the, we're, you know, we're funded by the government. We got an $817,000 um, cash grant to launch this whole idea with another equivalent amount of money coming in through various partners, mainly through in-kind. And so we can approach all the farmers and launch this without any charge up front, which I think is, is pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. Faiz, you have a question. I can see your, your hand. Going yes, up. it works. Um, how do you um, establish a profit? Uh, or how do you establish? How do you calculate it? What metrics do you use? And how do you make sure that the farmers are not buying all the stuff to keep the profit down? And why haven't you not then choose for revenue, which I think you partly explained. But I think mm -hmm. it must have been an, uh, an option you've look, you have looked at. And in addition to that, do you do it since the farmers have already some part of organic, do you do it over their entire farm as operations or mm. only on the land that they have converted? Because I think that must have been a uh, process of thinking as well. And by the way, thanks. And I think you're really deep into it. Um, I've looked at similar things and it's so recognized so much that it's actually super nice. Thanks for your uh, story. I should have started with that, but the question was on the top. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Um, yeah. To your second question, um, this, yeah, this type of capital will be for the acres that are transitioning to organic. Um, so, you know, they have a, let's say they have a thousand acres over here that they own and are organic, but they have 500 more that are conventional. This loan will be specifically for those 500 acres. And, you know, in talking with many farmers, um, there are many that have multiple operating loans depending on their operation. They might have one for their organic acreage, one for their conventional, and then they're finding another, maybe they're using their off-farm job to fund their transitional acres. Um, and then on the net profit share piece, you know, there's a few different pieces here, uh, but to calculate it, we essentially want it to be, we, we really want to tie our risk to, to the farmer's success. So, it's going to be after their fixed cost of, you know, paying their mortgage insurance after their variable cost every year from, you know, seeds, diesel, labor, et cetera, um, as well as their family expenses. And then everything that's left over, that's what we'll be considering, you know, net profit. Cause that's actually what the farm is making. And, you know, to really have us understand and make sure that those numbers are accurate. Um, there's two different pieces that we're looking at. The revenues are pretty easy where uh, essentially we can just have them show us their receipts and market contracts and where they sold their crop. And since we're helping set them up with those markets through pipeline and grain millers and, you know, Patagonia and such, um, those relationships are going to be pretty open and we'll, we'll know how many bushels they sold. And then on the cost side um, and tracking their expenses, you know, the, the model that Phil ran through of farm planning and farm design, we're going to be in there with them on the ground, understanding and creating that organic system plan with them. So we're going to know if anything is misrepresented by, you know, 10, 15%, because to plant an acre of corn is depending on, you know, what, what uh, equipment they're using and what, you know, their leases and all those different factors. It, it's pretty well known in different regions, so it's hard to really misrepresent that. Yeah, and I would say that, um, you know, we currently work through enterprise budgets, full enterprise budgets with our producers now. And, you know, one of the things that we're asking ourselves as we develop our due diligence process and um, method for distributing the loan is finding shared agreement on what the enterprise models are and what the costs are. So like currently we sit with farmers and we say, hey, let's work through the whole enterprise budget. Revenues is easy, here are all your costs. Um, like tell us what it costs. And then we'll say, well, this is what we're seeing in, in the region. And what's nice about the US is we have um, extension agents that de develop and deliver enterprise budgets for every state. And so there are like regional norms and right now in our own fund pro forma and farmer pro formas, um, we're, we're going to be starting to conduct sensitivity analyses. So it's like, okay, you know, let's, let's say the, the cost of harvest fluctuates by 20% up or down. How does that affect revenue and payback to the fund? We can, and we can start toggling all of those things to ensure that, you know, the fund is still going to work with some flex around these cost estimations. I mean, there are certain things that are just unmovable, like diesel costs this, it takes this much in your tractor, your acre is this big, 
and you should only pass over the field once. I mean, that's a pretty, that's algebra, you know? And so um, we, we just, you know, some of that stuff can't be, you know what I mean? And I, I'm, I'm, I'm saying this because um, this has been a big question that comes up. I think we're still discovering our tactile on the ground process. You know, I would say that we're test driving a lot of that now in our current work, um, what that feels like, what it looks like, what the far shared agreement with the farmer is. Um, but um, yeah, the net profit share is kind of critical to the essence of the fund. And so we're, we're working hard to make sure that works. Yeah, and then we're also leaning on some experts that have been at it for decades at this point, <clears throat> like Craig Chase and Paul Beatman, who literally wrote the book on farm finance. Um, so Craig's helping improve our backend models and creating all these different baseline scenarios <clears throat> based on you know, various equipment, cropping type, uh, revenues from where they're selling in the market. And then we're working with Paul to help really hone up our farm due diligence process and create an effective framework to filter good opportunities from bad opportunities. And then running all that data ultimately through this, what Phil was alluding to, like a Monte Carlo simulation where we're gonna have a risk register in the back end and we'll be able to then test different you know, risk within the, on a portfolio level and a fund level and then see anticipated outcomes. And that's all in process. And that's going to take us another two, three months to get that all battened down. Mm -hmm. But um, we have all the teams working on it already. No, super clear answer. And actually, um, yeah, I think you're super deep into it is in a, in a good way. Uh, I'm not sure if that translates well, but uh, no, no. Yeah. No, We've I appreciate the compliment. Every single step. We feel pretty deep. <laughs> Obsessed might be a word. <laughs> yeah, obsession. Yeah, I think I think that can be said said by uh, for a few other people on on this call as well. Um, I want to no, thank you so I, much. I want to be conscious of your time. Go, go ahead, guys. No, I was just thinking you do you've done so much, and I've always find it a struggle where to start if you have to explain to an investor. You know, how do you pitch this and what do you select? There's so much as you started, this markets, this, and, and, yeah. and with region agri, you know, everything has to happen at the same time. And what I actually am not good at, and I was wondering how you were doing that, is how do you highlight some of the things to hook them on and then uh, go into deep? And how do you not scare them off with saying, okay, but you have to be and helping them with marketing and helping them in the community of practice. Yeah. And helping financing and those terms have to be flexible. It's, you know, I can see it because actually it's one of my struggles, but um, yeah. how do you do well, that? It's, um, it's a challenge. I would say that we, we go, we go slow. I mean, some pe this is one criticism we get. It's like, we well, you, you know, you can't go farm by farm to scale. And I actually totally disagree. Um, you have to go farm by farm to scale. Um, and, and we, we, we often think that like broad revolution and change is really hard. I mean, it's certainly hard, but won't happen, but it already happened like 40 years ago, all of corn and soy. Like, how did that happen? Like it happened farm by farm, individual decision makers saying this is the best move for my economy right now. So, you know, I think we have to kind of think about that similar theory of change in the next revolution in ag. And so I would say we go slow. I, I think the, the on the ground visioning process that we have is the, the fundamental and we can quickly sift through sort of where they're strong, where they're weak, what they do want to do and what they don't want to do. And then we, we often suggest starting small. I mean, this is part of the reason we're working with organic farmers that are already organic, you know, to change your whole operation to organic in three years is really difficult and very few people do that. And so, um, you know, we're cognizant that change is slow. Um, but a eureka moment or two can really tilt the whole thing. Um, I don't know. I, I don't think it's really answering your question. I think it's, it's more just... I think you okay. did. Yeah. And, okay. you know, it may seem, like, intimidating to farmers. Like, this could be a lot for them to be able to handle. But just in being able to get this in front of farmers from different groups like PFI and IOA and Moses that have really blasted this out to their networks, it's actually there something clicks when they see it because so far we've had about 18,500 acres sign up um, to want to apply for this loan and to use it, which, you know, would be a capital need of like $20 million. So it's already, we already have way more pipeline than we can possibly service. Um, so just in the next few months, as we bring more farmers in as well, 
I mean, something here is working, um, whether it's the markets or the finance or just the loan with technical assistance. I, we're not entirely sure what it is yeah. yet, but from like a user design experience, you know, side of things, like when farmers see it, they know they want it, uh, which is, <laughs> you know, which is great um, yeah. for us. So we're doing something right. And if we can then encourage others to also adopt this type of mentality, I mean, that's just great for the industry as a whole. So yeah, I would say, you know, out of great pain, great innovation occurs. And we are in a, in a low spot in, in commodity industrial agriculture and farmers I mean, you look at like suicide rates and like the opioid epidemic and obesity, all of these things are characteristic of a very toxic situation in the heartland. And we are kind of bringing a holistic solution to that, that, I, that the farmer can't fully comprehend, nor can we. I mean, this is the process and the feeling of emergence. Um, we really don't know where we're all going, but we know it's, it's a better place than where we are. And so I think we embody that sort of open creativeness in, in the, the shared journey, which I, I feel like is really critical for the farmer. We don't come in with a bunch of solutions. It's like, let's get to work together. And I feel like that mentality and approach is, um, it's created the trust, the will, and the passion to move forward. And I think that's how Mad Ag is represented. It's our reputation. It's the excitement. And um, it's very different than like, you know, your extension agent, your government official, your loan officer, your, you know, whatever it is, like, it's just fresh. And so, um, you know, that's a piece of our personality, I think, is also helping this work. Mm -hmm. I want to, I mean, there's so much more to cover. I don't think it's the last <laughs> time we're, we're talking and we definitely need to do some long form episodes and some deep dives. I want to thank everyone. Uh, first of all, Phil and Brendan, obviously, for taking the time this, this morning and for everyone that called in and for everyone that's watching this later uh, as it is recorded. Thank you so much. Great. And uh, definitely I will make sure link to link everything below and people can get in touch for more questions, follow-ups, ideas, et cetera, et cetera. Awesome. So much. awesome. Yeah, it's so much. thanks so much. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity. Really appreciate it. Yeah, nice to see you all. Yeah, it's fun.